The accident. You could say that it predetermined the fate of the stuntman, but without courage, daring and cunning, nothing would have been possible. When I was a kid, I did crazy things, climbing trees and falling down to test myself. When I was 17, I was in a car accident and went through the windshield, miraculously survived. My face was literally put back together piece by piece. I'm happy if at the end of the day I didn't go to the hospital, but came home unharmed and in my own car. Stuntmen don't last more than 7 years in the profession. I lasted 15. Right now we find out why Peter Kent became Schwarzenegger, how the jump on the Harley Davidson was filmed, why Peter needs nails, what happened in the Terminator, when to turn on the perch, and what the secret of Peter Kent's magic sauce is. Before I even showed up on the set, the special effects team had built this whole system. It's designed to lower you down with the bike. But I was working without a safety rope. And you know what else? Whoa, 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 we'll come back to that. In the meantime, let's go back and see where it all began. In late 1983, Peter Harris Kent flew to Los Angeles to conquer Hollywood, all that Peter had that day, a great desire to star in the movie and $2,000 in his pocket. A few months later, a newspaper ad, he got into the team to James Cameron to shoot Terminator, where he got a job as a technical double Arnold Schwarzenegger for $20 a day, Cameron immediately signed a contract with him, as Peter was something similar to Arnold, the same build, height, face shape and hair color, in order not to yank extra time, Hollywood star, and therefore save money on hourly wages, technical understudy play scenes for him, at this very time, the cameraman set up cameras, illuminators put the light, and assistants mark in what places on the set should be an actor, how he should move, where to turn, what to add, and what to remove. I flew to LA from Vancouver, not really knowing what I was going to do there. I just sold everything I had, bought a ticket, got on a plane and ended up in Los Angeles, and then I spent days looking for a job. I did get a call back from some casting agency and they left a message, and they said, we're making a little movie here. James Cameron would like you to be Arnold Schwarzenegger's understudy. And oddly enough, back in Vancouver before I left, in late October, I dressed up for Halloween as Arnold from the movie Conan the Barbarian. I made myself the same cape out of stinky deer hide. I just managed to find the remains of a dead deer. Somebody threw it away, and I picked it up. And it was kind of funny the way it happened. I was in Los Angeles at the right place at the right time. I get to the office, James Cameron looks at me and says, is this about Arnold? I'm like, yes. And he's like, great. You'll be the technical understudy. And then he's like, then he goes to the producer and he's like, give him a contract. And he was about to leave, but he turned around and said, you were a stuntman too, right? And I was like, of course. I think if I'd said no, I wouldn't have been hired. And I really needed the job. Anyway, it worked. You call yourself a stuntman, get in the car and go, the next day Peter was already racing through the parking lot of the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, shooting shotguns on the fly, Peter was working under the direction of stunt director Frank Orsati, he fell, shot, drove a Dodge Monaco and a Honda. James Cameron saw in Kent strong brave guy who is not afraid of neither bruises nor fractures, but experienced masters do not fool, Orsati quickly figured out the trickster. Preparing props for a stunt in the club, Technoir, he asked Peter if he needed a ramp. It's a thing that's kind of like a springboard that throws the stuntman up, Peter was confused, as he had no idea what he was talking about. Turned on his perch, and was ready to lose his job, because such a self-taught, simply kicked off the set, Frank realized that Kent is not a stuntman, but such a strong and brave guy was very necessary in the team, and therefore Orsati decided to take care of everything himself, put the ramp, explained in detail to Peter, what and how he will do, and gave a couple of tips on safety. The workload increased every day and now for a shift Peter received twice as much, as much as $40. But no one trusted him with complicated and dangerous stunts, Pete raced well on the bike, but in the Santa Monica tunnel race took over the stuntman Gene Hartline. He crashed the bike and broke his leg. So you could say Peter was lucky. Not like Bruce Kerner, who was replaced by a puppet. But Peter Kent was driving the Chevy. The shootout at the police station could have cost one of the stuntmen his life if it hadn't been for Peter, 
This office was built in-house out of modular glass partitions, the glass in them is shattered to pieces by metal balls with a diameter of 2 cm, which are fired by assistance from air cannons. Before the next take, Pete froze on the spot with a machine gun at the ready. He noticed that the stuntman was standing right in the line of fire and stopped the shooting in time, thus saving the guy from imminent death. Terminator was my first really big, important, serious job, and you know, besides, I didn't have to compare and choose anything, I got straight into a big project. I came to the shoot with great enthusiasm and was on the set 24 hours a day. I remember when we had night shoots, we shot at night too, Arnold would go home early in the morning. The rest of us would slowly gather, shut the windows, and the entire night shift would go home at noon. The second shift arrives at 5 p.m., and I'm still on the set. I'd be there 24 or even 36 hours a day. Sometimes Arnold would come over to watch us do tricks. Often he'd come up and say, Peter, fuck you. I can do it myself. Usually he'd just sit in his trailer and drink coffee. Or he'd come out with a cigar in his teeth and coffee in a cup to see if everything was okay. He'd stand there for a while, take a look, and when he was sure I was alive and I was okay, he'd go back to his trailer to finish his cigar. He and I spent a lot of time in that trailer, drinking coffee and smoking cigars. It was such a cozy, friendly time. Peter quickly became friends and worked well with Arnold, as he showed his serious attitude and fighting character. If Schwarzenegger played badly or made mistakes, Pete never gave him an excuse, but on the contrary, directly said where Arnold was wrong. He even learned German, so he could understand what kind of swear word Schwarzenegger uses in his fits of despair and anger. Arnie was very surprised when Peter spoke to him in his native language, they often discussed their scenes. Pete helped Arnold to better reveal his character and get into the role, because, after all, Peter had a good acting school, a year after the Terminator, Schwarzenegger himself personally invited Peter Kent to work with him together in Commando. Then Peter began to intensively train to quickly gain muscle mass, with such a mentor as a seven-time Mr. Olympia, biceps, triceps, quadriceps, delts, abs and all this, grows like on yeast, not to say that Peter stunted that much in Commando. He ran and shot in the garden, elegantly jumped off the balcony and fought with Bennett, and he came in a rubber dinghy, too. In Commando, for Peter opened up new perspectives and opportunities. On the set, Pete met an acrobatic stuntman Bob Yerkes, who took him to his stunt school in the San Fernando Valley, where he taught him all the basic wisdom of this dangerous profession. The first, Terminator, in some places, was clearly beyond my physical capabilities. I can see why. Fortunately, when we started shooting the next movie called Commando, I had the opportunity to work with a great guy. His name was Bob Yerkes. He coached the cast of Circus with the Stars. You remember, it was on TV. They'd take famous and unknown actors and turn them into real circus performers in a short period of time. And then they'd perform in the arena with real circus performers. They had a whole training base there at trapeze for aerial gymnastics, inflatable trampolines, that sort of thing. Bob took me to his team and trained me. In general, he trained a lot of young stuntmen. A lot of guys started their careers with Bob Yerkes. In 1987, the action movie Running Man came out, where Peter was dragged along the ground behind a motorcycle in yellow spandex. In the sci-fi blockbuster Remember Everything, Pete got kicked in the balls and killed on the subway. Also, he appeared in Predator in the most unexpected places. When we're shown the thermal imager, the so-called Predator Vision, look closely at these shots I'm standing there, mostly in close-ups, without makeup and without a mask. You'll definitely realize it's not Arnold if you look closely at the shape of his face when he's talking to Billy and pointing at the trees. It was really me in those shots. Somewhere near the finale, where Billy stays on the bridge and waits for the predator to come for him. You see Sonny Landham pull out a machete and run it across his chest. But before that, my stomach comes into the frame, because Sonny's belly was bloated and looked terrible, and they wouldn't film it. Rewatch it sometime. 1991 gave the world the legendary sequel, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, where Peter Kent performed several difficult and dangerous stunts, the most spectacular one was a jump on a Harley Davidson. He brought Peter special popularity and recognition, he was included in the Hollywood Stuntman Hall of Fame, 
and the company, CNN, put this stunt in the top 10 best stunts in the history of cinema, to simulate the jump built a whole system of cables, a thick steel rope was stretched parallel to the track, about 200 meters long, held at both ends by cranes with a lifting capacity of one and a half tons each. The Harley-Davidson Fat Boy is attached by four ropes, two each, front and rear, to a three-meter long spreader bar on block rollers, another cable goes from the bar to a truck at the other end of the track, which dragged it along the rope with Harley at 60 kilometers per hour, before touching the ground, the Harley flew about 20 meters on the rope. It's a funny subject, when we were shooting Terminator 2, James called me and said, I want you to dub Arnold, I have a lot of work for you, come and we'll talk about it. I came, we talked, Jim showed me the storyboards and gave me the script. I read the script, and a couple of days later I fly in with a question. Jim, so what's up with your motorcycle? Do you want a Honda 500 or what? And he was like, no, no, only Harley, only Harley for the Terminator. I thought he was kidding and he was gonna smile. He didn't. Then I realized he was serious, and he was like, grab the guys, go with them to the warehouse and pick up five Harley Davidson fat boys. I want you to pick two of them and take them to the mechanics and they'll pump up everything you need carburetor, engine muffler, because we need a couple of the sharpest, fastest spikes. Anyway, everything was done to the best of its ability. They didn't touch the suspension, they just gave the engine a bit of a tune-up. Before I even got on the set, the special effects team had built this whole system. It's designed to lower you down with the bike. But I was working without a safety rope. And you know what else? No one had really tested how it would behave or if the jump would work until I got on the bike. It was not so easy to control the bike on these ropes. I strained my back muscles and rested my feet on the footrests, resisting the cables, leveling the bike, pressing it to the ground to make it ride normally. That is, I literally squeezed with my legs 350 kilograms, as in the gym on the simulator, forcing the bike to stand at the right angle. And then, one day, the brakes just failed. I couldn't stop and I nearly hit James Cameron. I remember he was standing there looking at me. He was looking through the camera. And you can't get the distance right with a camera. So there he is, looking into the camera. And I'm trying to keep a stone face like a real Terminator until the end. Finally, I step out of character and shout loudly at him. Get out of my way! He took his eyes off the camera, grabbed the folding tripod, and bounced away like a bullfighter. I flew a few centimeters away from him and threw the bike far behind him. I don't think I could have done it any other way. Afterward, Jim swore at me for a long time for wrecking the bike. Why the hell did you wreck the bike? There's only five of them. And I was like, thanks for your concern, Jim. Peter had to jump seven times. In the movie was the third take. According to Cameron, it was the best. Stunt director Gary Davis tried to convince James Cameron that the jump should be performed by experienced stunt riders Billy Lucas or Gilbert Combs. But Cameron wanted to show the Harley with the Terminator in close-up as much as possible, which meant that Peter Kent would be needed. Gilbert and Billy had run and tested the whole system 20 times. But the stunt still required concentration, physical strength, and was dangerous for both Peter and the operator. And if here Steadicam operator Jimmy Murrow especially did not risk anything, then when Jimmy filmed the horse running through the hotel in True Lies, it suddenly became frightened, stood on the pits and hooves blew the camera right in front of his nose. It may seem that for Schwarzenegger everywhere were stuntmen, and he did not work hard at all, only did that drinking coffee and smoking Cuban cigars, and this is partly true. Arnie smoked only real, Cuban cigars, but even though Arnold didn't put himself in danger, and no one would have let him, he still worked very hard, for two weeks Schwarzenegger practiced beautifully passing through the gates shooting off locks, deftly reloading the Winchester with one hand, they made him a shotgun with a larger trigger guard, but he still got blisters on his fingers, and once he mixed up the guns, grabbed the original Winchester and almost dislocated his hand trying to pull the reloading trick on the standard trigger guard. Eddie Furlong also got hit in the head a few times with a shotgun. One time Arnold hit him right in the eye, look at Eddie's reaction, it really hurt. But not dangerous, compared to mothballs, gasoline and a pile of garbage, here is a truly explosive mixture, prepared by pyrotechnicians to create a bright and spectacular explosion, only AT-800 can resist it. James Cameron told Peter, stand like the Terminator, he wouldn't even flinch.
You stand still and don't flinch. Otherwise we'll have to reshoot it. Jim gave the command, action, and boom, an explosion went off right in front of Peter. A heat-resistant suit, a protective wig and a thick layer of fireproof gel on his face saved the stuntman. He got it on the first take, true, Pete did not immediately understand why everyone laughed. Of course, after the explosion, he had a funny look, but this is not enviable. His wig had gone somewhere, his hair stood up, his face was black with soot and soot, and his forehead was badly burned. Jim was filming at the home of John's foster parents, Janelle and this, what's his name? And there was some dude there, I don't remember his name. And Jeff Don just did my makeup and my mask, and it took him six hours. And Jim says, Pete, take the bike and ride around and I'll stand around and see what you look like in the mask. As I sliced around in circles I prayed, I'm terrible, I'm terrible, I wish it would go away. Jim, don't you dare. And I see Jim put his finger up, and I'm like, oh shit. Peter was the first stunt double to use such a mask to maximize his resemblance to the actor, since the shooting was conducted on three locations in different areas of Los Angeles, Peter drove in a mask on his black Porsche to one, then another site, which greatly shocked the people around him. At the Galleria, Peter scared the hell out of amazed Japanese tourists. He flew out through the window glass, and began to tear the mask from his face, stretching it in different directions, the Japanese thought it was Schwarzenegger shouted to him, trying to attract attention, but in the end they saw a scene from a horror movie, did everyone recognize the photographer? This isn't just another cameo by co-screenwriter William Wisher, according to Cameron, it's the cop from the first installment, who got hit by the T-800 in a police dodge. The mask smooths out the difference between our faces, and it's basically a latex overlay of two casts. I then had to wear it for 66 days straight. Imagine how your face burns when the makeup glue is absorbed into your skin. It's just awful. But I did not go to the extreme and several times at the end of the day myself removed the mask. When the makeup people found out about it, I told them, Guys, back off. Leave me alone. I'll do everything fine by myself. The latex mask was an inconvenience. Peter had worn it for so long that he had almost got used to it, but at the steel mill, it did get to him. The glue had melted from sweat, seeping out and eating his eyes. The pain was unbearable, so Peter took a pair of surgical scissors and cut out a large piece of latex in one fell swoop. Of course the mask changes the features of the face, but in long shots only a blind man would notice the difference. James Cameron keeps up with the times and in 2017 he not only released a remaster of his brainchild in 3D, but also made sure that Peter was made Schwarzenegger's face, how much progress has been made, well, you can't tell the difference, but Peter can speak in Arnold's voice without computers. You need to get into gym here now because you're too scrawny. The guys were in Chicago for the shooting of Red Heat, Pete guessed to call the reception and in the voice of Schwarzenegger ordered a royal dinner in his room, steaks, lobsters, cheesecake and wine. Arnie was very surprised when he was billed $1,000 for all these delicacies. Holy but then he quickly realized that it was Peter's pranks and refused to pay the bill on principle, so the Joker had to shell out a hefty sum. Two years passed and Pete found a convenient moment to get back at Arnold for greed, just when he had a romantic scene with Penelope Miller in Kindergarten Cop. Peter is a pretty good cook. He often treated Schwarzenegger to his specialty, spaghetti with magic Canadian sauce. Not surprisingly, then Pete decided to treat Arnie, and brought him to the set of a double portion, but he made an unusual sauce, generously mixing in the juice of Brussels sprouts, cauliflower and broccoli. After that, you're looking at two hours of uncontrollable farting. Which is exactly what happened, Penelope was horrified by the stench, and Arnold grabbed Peter and interrogated him about what kind of cooking he had fed him. Peter didn't confess until five years later. Here Peter Kent, there Peter Kent. But not all laurels only to him. You've got to give credit to other stuntmen, for example, such as Lane Levitt. He drove up the stairs on a police, Kawasaki, in the office of Cyberdyne Systems and with acceleration flew out the window, or Chuck Tamburo, a Vietnam War veteran and professional military pilot. Chuck not only played a poor pilot, but also piloted the Jet Ranger, flying under the overpass literally one meter above the ground. The idea was so dangerous that none of the cameramen agreed to shoot such a stunt. Cameron himself took the camera, sat in the car and shot the scene from two angles, 
first passing behind the helicopter, and then in front of it, there he is, Cameron, the same James Cameron of the 90s, nowadays they draw such things on computers, but back then the guys took risks, creating a masterpiece. Now no one would risk running from a small truck to a 10-ton tractor without safety ropes, at 100 km per hour, but Peter did, and left the crew without lunch, all night they raced the Chevrolet and Freightliner back and forth, calculating every move, at 4 in the morning, Peter told Cameron that he was ready to go all out and do the stunt right now, James replied, dude, if this works out, I'll give you an Oscar for balls of steel, then grabbed the loudspeaker, cancelled his lunch break and called everyone back to the set, Cameron is not used to it, he is like a Terminator himself, almost does not eat or sleep, but the others, instead of lunch, had to pay compensation, $20,000, 100 bucks each, to get out of the cab and stand on the edge of the pickup truck, Peter came up with a simple trick. I hammered a bunch of finishing nails into a wooden board and screwed it to the body. I put on my thick-soled motorcycle boots and ran across the nails sticking up, all ingenious and simple, Peter was glad to be alive, climbed onto the roof of the Freightliner and tapped his feet on the hood, Cameron loved it, too. But it was too fast. James asked Pete if he could do the trick again and run the pickup a little slower, Peter knew what he was getting into, and there was no way he'd be willing to risk it twice in a row, Cameron decided he would just slow it down in post-production. That was the deal, but they almost fought once, in 94, Cameron gave Peter a real scandal in front of everyone. James was bitten by the Terminator fly, he was furious that Peter allows himself a lot, leaves for lunch whenever he wants, constantly smoking cigars, making fun of everyone and all day long hangs out in the trailer at Arnold. They were ready to punch each other in the nose, but Peter managed to settle the conflict and friendship won out, the whole thing ended with a terrific dive that Cameron really needed, when Pete climbed out of the water, James gave him a big manly hug and said, you son of a bitch. That was perfect, dot, Cameron is a stubborn perfectionist. Otherwise, it's unlikely he would have reached such heights, James goes above and beyond, demands the impossible and gets what he wants, in 2002, he admits that now he would never shoot that stunt with a pickup truck and Freightliner, because it is really very dangerous, and that's kind of a compliment to Peter Kent, a man who has mastered the art of risking his life, in the last movie Hero. If Peter hadn't thought of putting a wide, thick plate of fiberglass under his shirt, he would have broken all his ribs. His experienced colleagues discouraged him, why do you need that thing? It will only get in the way, but Pete did it his way. The t-shirt ripped, the plastic cracked in half, but the bones were intact, and in the scene where Jack Slater runs through the cars, Peter glued sandpaper everywhere, so that he could somehow hold on and not slip before time in ridiculous cowboy boots. The last Chevy Impala had a special windshield that cracked to dissipate the energy of the impact. On the third take, the glass did not crack, Peter fell and hit hard, knocked off his kidneys, and the next day urinated blood, you can't anticipate everything, well, he forgot to change his swimming trunks, in 1996, on the set of, The Eraser, Peter almost crushed by a three-ton container. The plan was that at a certain point all the slings would be cut automatically, the container would fall, and Peter would remain hanging on the safety rope, but due to incorrect wiring, one of the four hydraulic trimming units failed to work, it simply lacked power. The huge cargo container dangled from one sling in different directions and slammed Peter several times into the concrete wall of a nearby warehouse. Despite numerous bruises, three broken ribs, ankle, collarbone and scapula, his spine was intact and two months later Pete was back on his feet and in good health. All thanks to his excellent fitness, Peter regarded it as a sign from above, and after rehabilitation with such stunts stop. But from the movie and from the profession did not leave, 15 years and 14 movies with Schwarzenegger make themselves felt when the body aches and bones break in the morning. But this did not prevent him from very successfully prove himself as a director, screenwriter, producer and actor, Peter has played more than 60 roles in movies and television. He wrote a book called, Stand or Fall, about his fascinating and dangerous career as a stuntman, and in 2010 opened a stunt school, where anyone who wants to get a lot of thrills, learn the basics of acrobatics and martial arts, underwater and high altitude training, learn how to fall correctly, jump high and burn beautifully, in 84 Peter had no such training. But he had plenty of courage, daring and cunning, 
as well as the brilliant James Cameron and the great Arnold Schwarzenegger. Jim was happy to work with me, because I already had acting school. When I first came and realized that I had to duplicate another actor, of course I understood what duplicate means. It means to completely copy every trait of the character. The Terminator has his own unusual plasticity. He moves in his own way. I studied it all, and like any good actor, I embodied all my past experience in the second Terminator. Dot. But I did it a little better and more gracefully than I did the first time. Jim noticed it, of course, and even praised me several times. You know, several times. One day it happened that Arnold was late for the shoot, and arrived much later than usual. And Jim was like, Oh, for crying out loud, if I'm gonna shoot, Terminator 3, it's gonna be with you, to hell with Arnold. And I was like, wow, that's 20 million bucks. I remember a story Peter Kent told. That's where at the very beginning of the first Terminator, where Schwartz goes up to the punks, and they say to him, Hey, uncle. Hey, it's bath day, you got your underwear in the wash and nothing to wear, it was filmed at the observatory in Griffith Park. Arnie was very nervous, he was really nervous, because he was filmed without pants, naked. But what can you do, art requires, Cameron said, naked means naked, you can't argue with him, we set up a tent with a gas but warmer. And we're off and to ease his nerves, Schwartz ordered himself some sushi and sake. Sake is a Japanese vodka, rice vodka. Arnold also called Peter and said, Pete, get over here now. You'll be moral support. They shoot a take, one, two, three. Suddenly the wind picked up. The wind blows on the tin, it's freezing cold. Schwartz went to the tent to warm up, and then Peter said to him, Arnold, if things go on like this, you risk not having a penis, Dot, and Schwartz tensed up and said, Peter, thanks for your concern, but I've already frozen my balls off. 